The Better Climate Model. This is another climate craze update on climate models. Remember that in my prior video called Manabi Wins Nobel Prize for a Climate Model, Manabi was the brains behind the GFDL climate model from Princeton University. And it turns out that his GFDL climate model was the worst model out of the 102 climate models because it was the hottest of them all and thus was the farthest from reality. Manabi's GFDL model was much hotter than the average of all the other climate models as represented by this red line. And here we presented this bar graph showing that his GFDL climate model was indeed the hottest of them all. So which model was the best? The answer is down here to the right. The Russian model, the INMCN model. Now, let's see how well the Russian model performed with respect to the other climate models using a time series graph. This graph is a little different than the first one shown, but this one plots the 24 major groups of climate models, which contain the 102 separate models. And as before, the thick red line is the average plot of the 102 climate models. Below, the green and blue lines are the satellite and weather balloon data, or the real world data. Now, look at this tan line. It is the Russian model. It is the most accurate model with respect to the real world data. So now let's go back to the bar chart, which shows the relative accuracies of all 102 climate models. Again, here is the Russian model. And now a short description about these other colored lines. The colored lines are not climate models, but observed temperature data. The blue UAH line is satellite data generated by the University of Alabama at Huntsville. The red RSS line is also satellite data, but is generated by the Remote Sensing Systems Organization located at Santa Rosa, California. And finally, the green line is the most important because it is the average of several weather balloon data sets called radiosonde data. This balloon data is the most accurate source of atmospheric data. And notice that when you average the two satellite data bars, the UAH and RSS data, you come very close to the green line composed of radiosonde data. One last note about this graph. Notice that this graph displays temperature data for the lower troposphere because this is the closest to the surface. However, the models are designed to create forecasts for the entire depth of the troposphere, where all our weather occurs, even the 10 mile high hurricanes. So now let's look at this last graph. Here's the 10 mile high graph. It shows outputs for the 25 major climate models as compared to radiosonde data. And it is for the Earth's tropical regions from 20 degrees south to 20 degrees north. The best part about this graph is it shows model output for all levels throughout the troposphere. Earth's surface is here at 1000 millibars and at the top about 10 miles high is the 100 millibar level. So let's ignore the squiggly lines for now and focus on the reference information from which comparisons are made. This thick black line represents no temperature change. The small green, red, and purple circles represent three different radiosonde data sets. The small black box is the average of those three radiosonde data sets, and they are all plotted here. I will now connect those average small black boxes with a thick blue line. This thick blue line is the actual temperature change of our tropical atmosphere from 1979 to 2015. It shows mostly warming throughout the tropical atmosphere, except for some cooling at the highest levels. Yes, it does show cooling higher up, but this is another subject for another video. So let's now see the climate model forecasts and see how they compare to radiosonde reality. First of all, the thick black line is the average heating from all 25 model groups. And the smaller dots and dashes are the individual model groups as listed along the right side of this diagram. Before focusing on the Russian model, remember the GFDL model? It was the worst model and yet it won the Nobel Prize. Well, here it is again. It is the solid orange line, which goes off the chart higher up in the atmosphere. And now for the Russian model. It is the dotted orange line. 
It is the closest to the ground truth radiosonde data at all levels. This is amazing. And yet not one word from the mass media. Before continuing, I need to remind everyone of the media's fixation on Russia, Russia, Russia. Adam Schiff warned us about Russia during January of 2020 when he said this about Russia. Their worldview is completely antithetical to ours. So I'm not sure if antithetical also means anti-science, but it sure would explain why the media avoids mentioning the Russian climate model results. Whatever the reason, it appears that the Russian models are not to be trusted, even if they are the most accurate, which helps explain why they gave the Nobel Prize to the worst model. Now, if you had trouble following that line of reasoning, it's because I used antithetical logic. So let's see what the Russians are saying about climate change and their model. There are many Russian publications available on the internet, but here are two of them. First, in 2017, seven Russian scientists published Russian thinking on cosmic rays and the sun's influence on climate change. This was presented at the All-Russian Conference on Cosmic Rays. Second, in 2021, two Russian scientists published their findings on the greenhouse effect in the atmosphere. This was published in Moscow in the Advances in Fundamentals of Physics. A summary of their works are presented here. Number one, carbon dioxide is not the main driver of climate change, while water vapor is the main heating gas. Number two, the Russian model has the lowest CO2 forcing than all the other climate models. And number three, the Russian model has the highest climate system inertia, meaning it favors natural planetary forcing as driven by the sun. And so even though the Russian model may have used antithetical science, Russia should have won the Nobel Prize in physics because it is the most accurate of them all. So remember, there is no climate change crisis, just a Nobel Prize Committee decision-making crisis.